I know you didn't actually show up to see the 10 part Ken Burns video, um, but we are partnering uh, and, uh, with KCPT uh, and uh, with uh, uh, four other libraries, Johnson County, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Mid-Continent, and North Kansas City in the NEA Big Read. Um, and the, uh, we, we've done a number of big reads over the years, uh, which I think many of you uh, know. Uh, this year is very special because I think this is the first time a big read has been done by so many libraries in collaboration across state lines, uh, et cetera. And of course, the, uh, the book for the big read is The Things They Carried, which uh, Tim O'Brien will, will be here to talk about, and I'll introduce him in, uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, but this, our, our, our partnership with, uh, with KCPT is important to this, our ongoing partnership with KCPT and with our fellow libraries with whom we collaborate on a lot of things, which we hope uh, is actually a model for collaboration around the, the metro. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of people take us, uh, you know, imitate our model, but, uh, but we're working on it. Um, and uh, uh, I think that collaboration is important, and we're hoping that as many people as possible read, uh, read this. Um, uh, as you know, uh, Ken Burns was here. He came to Kansas City for KCPT in part because uh, some of the uh, important advisors uh, to Ken Burns and Lynn Novick for uh, the film uh, are, are from Kansas City or based at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, John Musgrave, I'm told, is here tonight. John, are you? You're here somewhere, right over here. <laughs> Jim Wilbanks, Jim, are you here by any chance? Jim is not. Jim is the, is the head of the history department at Fort Leavenworth and Command School, a longtime friend of the library. You know that we do a lot with the Command School at Fort Leavenworth, uh, and, uh, and Jim is significantly responsible for that. And like John Musgrave, was a significant advisor to Ken Burns and Lynn Novick on the, the 10 part, uh, the extraordinary 10 part. Uh, film. We also want to thank, besides thanking the NEA, we want to thank uh, Arts Midwest. Uh, we want to thank the Missouri Humanities Council, uh, which has helped us with the, uh, the funding, as the NEA has, uh, for, uh, for all of this. Um, I do want to mention in passing that the Missouri Humanities Council gave us their uh, uh, Community Achievement Award uh, this year at the Kansas City Public Library. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I, I want to mention also our ongoing partner in all things uh, literary, uh, the uh, Rainy Day Books, which is the, the world's greatest bookstore located right here in Kansas City. And, and that leads me to, to tell you that the book is for sale uh, uh, from Rainy Day uh, at the back of the auditorium. And uh, uh, Tim O'Brien will be here on the stage after his talk uh, signing, uh, signing your copies. Um, and uh, so we're grateful for, for Rainy Day doing, uh, doing that. Um, I also want to thank, uh, at the, uh, from the library, Katie Stover, uh, who is our reader's representative, and, uh, uh, the, and she helped organize this, and, and it was her idea to, to get Tim O'Brien to, to come. Uh, I want to thank the Public Affairs Department, uh, our Development uh, Department, Kristen Nelson and Logan Hegeman uh, for what, what they've done. Um, I do also want to mention, uh, I want to mention some upcoming programs. Uh, first, uh, I want to uh, mention uh, a uh, non-Vietnam uh, related program, uh, but uh, uh, it's not in our calendar. Uh, we got it, we booked it too late to, to go into the calendar, but on October, uh, excuse me, on October 20th, Wade Davis uh, will be uh, here at the Plaza Library. Uh, Wade uh, uh, is the author of two extraordinary books, a number of books, but two extraordinary books, The Serpent and the Rainbow, about Haitian religion, zombies, et cetera. He may be responsible for the zombie craze. I don't know. And, uh, and, and that, was, uh, that book was from, from about uh, 2000. Um, he's an anthropologist originally, but, he, but uh, more recently he wrote a book called Into the Silence, which is about the impact of World War I uh, on uh, the British climbers, mountain climbers, um, how they treated uh, World War I, came to, to, to invest a kind of existential uh, uh, reality to what they were doing as mountain climbers, uh, meaning of life kind of thing. And, and, uh, and it, it was part of the inspiration for Mallory uh, to uh, climb Everest. Whether or not he got to the top, we still don't know. Uh, but as you know, he was the first to really attempt it. 
uh, and uh, and in 1999 they found his body, and there's still there's still an argument going on, which uh, Davis talks about about whether or not he reached the top. Um, anyway, it's an extraordinary book, and we're, uh, uh, we're we have Wade Davis in the library because uh, uh, it, in partnership with the World War One Museum for obvious reasons, and with the Lyric Opera because the Lyric Opera in November will be doing Everest. It'll be only the second time that Everest has been produced, an extraordinary contemporary opera about the 1996 climb of Everest, in which something like 15 people uh, lost their lost their lives. Uh, the Lyric Opera will also be bringing uh, Beck Weathers, um, who was left for dead near the top of Mount Everest and came, those of you who've seen the two movies about it will know he came, came a few hours later after he was left for dead into camp, uh, m minus uh, uh, some of his appendages. Um, and the, and the, uh, the uh, uh, composer and the librettist will also be uh, 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 talking uh, about it. Um, so, uh, we also have an ongoing, and if you get our calendar, you'll see, or if you get this special Big Read uh, pamphlet, we have a significant number of things going on in November and into, no, uh, sorry, in October and into November. Um, uh, we have Mark Bowden coming uh, on October 18th here at the Plaza, it's next Wednesday. Um, he's written a book on the Battle of Hue, the turning point, the Tet Offensive uh, uh, in 1968 uh, of the war, and you know, he wrote Black Hawk Down. He's an extraordinary writer, one of the most propulsive writers of what might have been once, once upon a time called adventure stories. I'm not sure you call the Battle of Hawaii an adventure story, but uh, he's an extraordinary writer. Um, and uh, we will we'll be having a program about the music of Vietnam. We got to get out of this place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War by Doug Bradley, who's written a book of the same title. Uh, and uh, that's on uh, October 19th. Uh, and uh, we have a, a program about the protests and dissent, uh, Rebecca Davis, and Sandra Enriquez uh, on October 25th. Uh, and uh, then Jim Wilbanks himself, Colonel Wilbanks, uh, will be here, uh, uh, will be at Central Library on October 31st uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, his own role uh, in Vietnam, which is uh, uh, extraordinary. Which You can see him uh, in, in the Ken Burns uh, 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 videos too. Uh, and then on November 14th, Whitney Terrell, our great, uh, who's himself, our local, great local novelist, has written a, a novel, as you know, The Good Lieutenant, about the, the war in Iraq. Um, we'll be talking uh, with the, the author, uh, Helen Benedict, author of Wolf Season, uh, about women and war. So, uh, on to uh, introducing uh, Tim O'Brien. Um, Tim O'Brien um, has said, there is no such thing as a good war for war stories, uh, or at least that's certainly true uh, of Vietnam. Um, and that's kind of extraordinary in and of itself because he's written three books uh, full of stories about his experience in Vietnam. Uh, if I Die in a Combat Zone, his first book, which is a memoir uh, of uh, his, his own platoon in Vietnam, uh, going after Cacciato, which won the National Book Award 1979, I think, and uh, a little bit more recently, 1990, The Things They Carried, uh, the Big Read uh, book, and all three of them extraordinary books. Uh, he's been called, uh, of course, the best writer of his generation. Um, this trilogy of uh, Tim O'Brien's Vietnam experience, one nod fiction, two fiction, about the same events and the same people, the same lakes in the north woods of uh, the north country, Minnesota, uh, the same people uh, uh, and, and, and somewhat smaller and not quite as deep lakes in the rice paddies of Vietnam, deep waters, even when only inches deep. As one expects in war stories, there's a lot about courage, but also about futility and cowardice and embarrassment and fear. And what we find out about courage is ambiguous. It has something to do with knowledge and something to do with fear and always something to do with a sense of obligation, not just to comrades or the nation or family, though perhaps all three, uh, and maybe not all three, maybe they are illusions. Um, uh, but still, an important sense of obligation. He fantasizes a lot. Going after Cacciato is the quixotic story of a platoon that makes its way from Vietnam to Paris, overland, stopping in Mandalay, Tehran, Ankara, et cetera, et cetera, along the way. He specializes, as he says, 
about true stories that never happened. There are a lot of curious characters in these books, not the least Socrates, the Socrates of the Credo, Plato's Credo, who accepts the obligation to die, perhaps to unjustly die for his country as he perhaps justly or perhaps unjustly fought for it once. And his obligation to comrades, family, and tradition, maybe even country, but certainly to his sense of self. And that's what Tim O'Brien writes about. There may be no moral to this story, as he, say, as he says, but the story is about morals, is about our relationship to morals. There are legends and ghosts that haunt these books as the Vietnam War haunts our national imagination. Tim O'Brien is the featured speaker, not just of the big read, but of our ongoing consideration of that event in our national drama, our national consciousness, uh, the Vietnam War. Just how we go about considering wars in Asia ought to be very much on our minds today. But there is another reason to read Tim O'Brien. He says that a story can be a miracle because it can keep characters from our lives alive as long as the words are read. There are many characters that owe their long lives to the not so small miracles of Tim O'Brien's prose. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim O'Brien. Hello. Uh, I'm scared to death. I'm honored and I'm flattered uh, to be asked to come to Kansas City and talk to you. Uh, the honored and the flattered part, I know you will understand, but I want to begin by saying a word about scared. Uh, when I began thinking about what I would speak about tonight, it quickly occurred to me that I don't know anything. I'm a novelist, I make it all up, the stories are invented, and I'm not required to know anything. It comes out of my imagination. Uh, and I'm not being falsely humble. I, for everything that I know about the world, I also know the opposite. And I'm the sort of person, by temperament, and maybe because of my family, who are anti-absolutism, even when it comes to issues about what is true and false about our world. On top of that, I'm not a public speaker. I'm a guy who sits in his underwear all day long <laughs> writing stories. And I don't mean all day long necessarily, I mean for sometimes weeks on an end, I will not... I do change the underwear, but, but <laughs> I don't leave the house, I don't go grocery shopping. I'm a writer, and writing, as anyone in this room who does it knows, it's a, it's a, you, you do it alone. You don't do it in the company of 800 people, that's for sure. I'm not a philosopher, I'm not an historian, um, I'm not even, uh, you know, I'm not a kind of, kind of guy who likes going on television or radio, and yet I think it's so important to uh, talk about the subject I'll be talking about tonight that I make myself do it. Uh, even though my, all my instincts are to scurry outside and go to a barbecue place and, you know, eat barbecue and drink beer, but here I am. I'm not Bill O'Reilly, I'm not Chris Matthews, I'm not Tony Danza. I'm a writer, I'm not a speaker. Um, what I'm doing right now is almost exactly the reverse of what I do for a living and for fun. Uh, a good story is specific. It, the characters are doing things on the page. You don't generalize about the world in a story, as a historian might do if he were up here. A good story is not abstract, it's detailed. A good story does not moralize, it doesn't preach at you, it doesn't offer advice to you about how to live your life. What's the moral of Hansel and Gretel? Stay away from gingerbread houses, What's the moral of Thumbelina? Eat your carbohydrates, grow up, you know, don't be an inch tall. There is none. 
morals and abstractions, especially when you're talking about a phenomenon like war, uh, don't appeal to me. A good story, I think, makes your stomach believe. It makes your tear ducts believe. It makes the nape of your neck believe. A story is aimed at the entire human being and not just at the brain, not just the rational faculty we all have. A story will appeal to the nape of your neck and the back of your throat. From the time I was a little boy growing up in the turkey capital of the world, Worthington, Minnesota, in the middle of nowhere, I've been a believer in the power of stories in our lives, and I mean all kinds of stories. The stories that our moms and dads tell us, the stories we hear in Sunday school, the stories we read in books, the stories we tell ourselves late at night when we're lying in bed and can't remember how we got from where we were to where we are right now. Stories can encourage us. They can embolden us to march into our own lives. Stories can give us access to other people's lives. Stories can make us feel, on occasion, if the story is good enough, a little less alone in this terrifying and depressing universe we all live in. Stories can offer us late-night company, us, and taking us through those bleak hours of our lives when we can't remember how we got from where we were to where we are. Stories remind us in the end that we're all part of something mysterious and universal. That journey down the birth canal, out into the light, and then toward the grave. We all go through it. And stories remind us that we're not alone in that journey. So I'm stuck. What do I do tonight? Uh, what I I've, I've, backstage, I kind of threw away in my head the bulk of what I was going to talk about and decided to be just to hone in on a, on a story and then uh, talk about where the story originated in the real world and why I wrote it and where it came from. It's almost impossible to talk about an entire book, the things they carried as my assignment, but I can talk about a small portion of the book, which is what I planned, and, and that'll speak about the book itself as a whole, I hope. Before telling that story, though, I want to say a few words about writing. For those of you in this audience who have written or want to write or, or will write, uh, as a professional writer, a man who has made his living at this now for many decades, I feel it's an obligation to try to help people if they want to write. So I've come prepared with a couple of tips to offer you. Uh, and those of you who don't care about writing, don't want to do it, just turn off your hearing aids and I'll be done in you know, two minutes. <laughs> Number one, these are little tips. Avoid ridiculous, flowery, decorative, long-winded language. For example, do not write this sentence. Her neck was like a swan's, long and arched and rubbery and graceful. <laughs> Instead, write, she honked. <laughs> Number two, avoid excessive, falsely poetic alliteration. Do not write this sentence. The red, rollicking river of her tongue rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> Instead, write, she kissed me, I gagged. Number three, use active and not passive language. Show us, don't tell us. Do not write this boring, passive sentence. Jack had been happily married for 20 years. Instead, write, Jack turned on the TV, opened the Cheetos, sat back, and scratched himself. <laughs> Finally, when writing fiction, as opposed to nonfiction, do not be afraid to lie. For a fiction writer, lying is a great and sublime and noble virtue. After all, think about it. Fiction writers choose to invent and to imagine for a reason. Otherwise, there would be no fiction.
There would be no novels, no short stories. Broadway would go dark. Uh, the movie industry would shut down. You know, Gwyneth Paltrow would be out of work. <laughs> She'd be waiting tables here in KC somewhere. Uh, as a novelist and as a story writer, I'm not limited by what happened. I can write about what almost happened, or what could have happened, or in my own case, my own life, what should have happened. As an example, my dad died. What seems to me fairly recently. It's actually probably four years ago now, and. In those final days and hours of my dad's life, I could have and I should have driven a lousy 40 miles to San Antonio, Texas, where he was in a hospital. For whatever reasons, some of them Midwestern, not wanting to look at a dying father and talk and say kind of uncomfortable words about love and so on, I didn't do it. I could have and I should have, but I did not. But in a story, miracles can happen. In a story, my dad can sit up from the dead, and he can reach out and take me in his arms, and he can say, "That's okay. I know you love me." Can't happen. The dead can't talk. But as I uttered those final words, my voice began to crack. I felt something that I didn't feel when I was telling you the truth, not going. As Pablo Picasso put it, a lot more elegantly than I can, art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. In a way, I've been talking for these first few minutes about the things they carried. Kind of slyly and through a back door, issues such as what does the word "true" mean when we talk about what's true in the world? Politicians telling us what's true, dominoes will fall, and this sort of rhetoric.、Uh, how do we adjudicate issues of truth? Truth changes over time. It's changed for me as a veteran of Vietnam, and it will have, and it continues to change now for me as a as an older father. The world changes. No one in this room believes the same things are true that you believed when you were eight years old. That there's an Easter Bunny. If you do, you should, you know, visit a psychiatrist. Truth evolves over time. I could say now it's what, almost seven o'clock p.m. and it's true in Kansas, but it's not true in L.A., is it? Or on Neptune, is it? Or in Bangkok, is it? Truth has a temporal component. It changes over time. The things they carried is aimed at trying to call attention, in part, to the elusive nature of that word "true." Things we accept as true, that later we turn, we 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 change our minds about. One can say, for example, as I did back in college, to a good-looking blonde, "I love you." The world has changed. I did, but I don't now. People fall in and out of love all the time, and the truth changes in our own lives. And yet, we tend to think of it as a static thing that sort of floats before us as, a, as an object. There, there goes some truth, but the world, of course, is not that way. As、uh, Like this, I want to now sort of move away from this general stuff into the particulars of, a, of an event that's recounted in the things they carried. And what I want to do is I want to read to you just to, for just you know five minutes or four minutes or three minutes. I don't know how long it is. It's short. And then I want to spend the rest of my time talking to you about where the story came from in the real world of Vietnam that I lived in almost five decades ago now, half a century, which is almost impossible to believe. But nonetheless, it's true. Put the things are on that. When she was nine, my daughter Kathleen asked if I'd ever killed anyone. She knew about the war. She knew I'd been a soldier. You keep telling these war stories, she said. So I guess you must have killed somebody. 
It was a hard moment for me, but I did what I thought was right, which was to say, of course not. And then to take her on my lap and just hold her for a while. But here, right now, I want to pretend she's a grown-up. I want to tell her exactly what happened or what I remember happening. And then I want to say to her that as a little girl, she was absolutely right. This is why I keep telling war stories. He was a short, slender young man of about 20. I was afraid of him, afraid of something. And as he passed me on the trail, I threw a hand grenade that landed at his feet and killed him. Or to go back. Shortly after midnight, we moved into the ambush site outside a little village called Mike. The whole platoon was there, maybe 30 of us, spread out in the dense brush along the trail. And for five hours, nothing at all happened. We were working in two-man teams, one man on guard while the other slept, switching off every two hours. And I remember it was still dark when my friend Kiowa shook me awake for the final watch. The night was foggy and hot. For the first few moments, I felt lost, not sure about directions, not even sure where I was for a few seconds. I remember groping for my helmet and my weapon in the dark. I reached out and found three grenades and lined them up in front of me. The pins had already been straightened for quick throwing. And then, for maybe half an hour, I just kneeled there in the dark and waited. Very gradually, in tiny slivers, dawn began to break through the morning fog. And from my position in the brush, I could see ten or fifteen meters up the trail. The mosquitoes were fierce. I remember slapping at them, wondering if I should wake up Kiowa and ask for some repellent, and then thinking that was a bad idea. And then looking up and seeing the young man come out of the morning fog, He wore black clothing and rubber sandals and a gray ammunition belt. His shoulders were slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side as if listening for something. He seemed entirely at ease. He carried his weapon in one hand, muzzle down, moving without any hurry up the center of the trail. There was no sound at all, none that I can remember. And in a way, it seemed he was part of the fog, or part of my own imagination. But there was also the reality of what was happening in my stomach. I had already pulled the pin on a grenade. I had come up to a crouch. It was entirely automatic. I did not hate the young man. I did not see him as the enemy. I did not ponder issues of morality or patriotism or military duty. I just crouched and kept my head down. I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. I was terrified. There were no thoughts in my head about killing. The grenade was to make him go away, just evaporate. And I leaned back and felt my head go empty and then felt it fill up again. I had already thrown that grenade before thinking throw it. It was gone. The brush was thick and I had to lob it high not aiming. And I remember that grenade seeming to freeze above me 
for just an instant, as if a camera had clicked. And I remember ducking down and holding my breath and seeing little wisps of fog rise from the earth. The grenade bounced once and then rolled across the trail. I did not hear it, but there must have been a sound because the young man dropped his weapon and began to run just two, three quick steps. And he stopped and turned to his right and looked down at the grenade, tried to cover his head, but never did. It occurred to me then that he was about to die. I wanted to warn him. The grenade made a popping noise, not soft, but not loud either, not what you'd expect. And there was a puff of dust and smoke, a small white puff. And the young man seemed to jerk upward, as if pulled by invisible wires. He fell on his back. His rubber sandals had been blown off. He lay at the center of the trail, his right leg bent beneath him, his one eye shut, his other eye a huge star-shaped hole. For me, it was not a matter of live or die. I was in no real danger. Almost certainly, the young man would have passed me by. And it will always be that way. Later, I remember, Kiowa tried to tell me that the man would have died anyway. He told me it was a good kill. He told me I was a soldier. And this was a war. And that I should shape up and stop staring. But you see, none of that mattered. The words were way too complicated for me. All I could do was stare at the fact of the young man's body. Even now, almost half a century later, I haven't finished sorting it out. Sometimes I forgive myself. Other times, I don't. In the ordinary hours of life, I try not to think about it. But now and then, when I'm reading a newspaper or just sitting alone in a room, I'll look up and I'll see the young man step out of the morning fog. I'll watch him walk toward me, his shoulders slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side. And he'll pass within a few yards of me and suddenly smile at some secret thought. And then continue up the trail to where it bends back into the morning fog. Why of all the chapters and the things they carry do I choose this one? And there are a number of reasons that seem to me important and worth my talking about tonight. The first reason has to do with the central fact of that war, which, and of any war, which is death. Uh, the word war is just another word for sanctioned Homicide, I guess. It's sanctioned, so it's legal, so it's not strictly homicide, which is a legal crime, but it's sanctioned murder. Uh, it's good murder, if there is such a thing. And the story is about a single human death, one of the enemy. Um, 
that is so easy to overlook in a world where, we're, where we read headlines such as eight guys today died of an IED and went off outside Kabul or outside Baghdad. You get a number, you get a date, and it's so antiseptic as to be almost unreal. Your eye can pass, out or pass over it without any emotion at all. The only emotion, of course, is experienced by the children of those dead people and the mothers and the fathers and the lovers and the wives, the grandparents, the uncles, the neighbors, the friends. They feel it because for them that dead person is not a number. But for the bulk of us, it is. And it seems worth focusing on just for a, a second on the central reality of any war, which is death, killing people. A second reason I chose to do this story uh, tonight is because it's not true. Not in the literal sense. I have no daughter. Never did. I didn't have children when this was written. I now do. But I needed somebody to ask the narrator the basic question that adults will never ask us, except crazy people, which is, you were in a war, did you kill somebody? Or you must have killed somebody. But nobody does that as a grown-up. We're all polite. But a child, especially of nine years old, could ask such a question, and perhaps even likely would ask such a question, especially of her own father. And I needed the question to be asked as putting pressure on my narrator. So no children. On top of that, no hand grenade made up. No Kiowa, made up. No trail junction, made up. No morning fog, made up. No star-shaped hole. All those details are the product of a, of a novelist's imagination. But, in another, much more important sense, this story is completely true. As a soldier, almost half a century ago, I participated, as I'm sure John did and any other veteran in this audience who was a combat veteran, in innumerable ambushes. I didn't count them, but every other night, every third night, that was what we did in Quang Nai province. We would go out and lie in wait along a trail junction or near a village somewhere, sometimes um, based on intelligence, sort of unintelligent intelligence, because it never was true. Whatever we were told, the opposite always happened. Uh, but that's what we did as a regular sort of thing. It was part, and there, so there were dozens and dozens of ambushes that I participated in. And there were dozens and dozens, scores of dead bodies all around me for my tour of combat in Vietnam. They were all over the place, our own and the enemy. What I wanted to do in this story was to compress it all into a single event of, in a short little story of like three pages where you could feel a little bit of what I felt as a soldier all those years ago, in which I still feel sometimes every fifth night in my dreams, that, that jolting sense of there's something wrong with this merry-go-round, it's out of control, and I'm on it that sense of mixture of fear and the bizarre sensation of being in a war in the first place. It's a bizarre feeling to be in one. And it's even more bizarre to be in a war in which you don't believe, which was my case. Uh, I, I went to that war very reluctantly. I was drafted and I went kicking and screaming, not literally, but in my heart, and that's what I was doing. The best you could say about Vietnam, I thought, when I was drafted, was that, that, that certain blood was being shed for uncertain reasons, which is to say the bodies are for sure. Nobody disputed it. You know, conservative, liberal, they all admit that dead people are dead. They're for sure. And those without legs are for sure, and arms, and the orphans are for sure, and the widows are for sure. Nobody disputes it. But the reasons for the war were in great dispute. Hawks at the throats of doves. Anybody who lived through the 1960s and early 70s remembers this. My own family was divided over the rectitude of the war. My mom was for the war. My dad was against it. 
at the family, I remember at the dinner table, these arguments going on during my last year in college when I'd go home for Christmas or Easter break. Um, and as my own, uh, dra my own uh, uh, availability for the draft got closer and closer. I was almost out of college, and they had ended uh, deferments for graduate school, so I was, I was fair bait in a hometown. This was before the lottery. My hometown drafted me, people in my town, not some number. People whom I knew, whom my dad and mom knew, sent me to the war. And I could feel the pressure of this town on me as well. So the story is a way of collapsing the things I've been talking about just now into a single event that you could, I hope, participate in, and you might feel something. There was, though, one particular late-night ambush that is the basis for the story. It's the one that sticks out most in my memory and in my dreams. And I want to tell you about it, because I've never really written about it. We were, we were awakened, uh, this was a company of us, not a platoon, but a company of us, that's about 100 people, 100 men, roughly, in, in the army. We were awakened around 2 in the morning, all the platoon leaders came and shook us awake, those who were asleep, some were on guard. And we were told very quietly to saddle up, we were heading off, um, on an ambush. Well, this was odd, because ambushes are usually eight people or 12 people, sometimes a platoon, but very rarely a whole company. In fact, in my own experience, never uh, would a whole company go out on a thing called an ambush. Anyway, we were a little frightened by this, and we saddled up and put on all our stuff, our canteens and ammo, and grabbed our weapons, and we headed out into the Vietnam dark. We walked for about five hours, uh, or not that long, three hours. So it was near dawn when we finally approached this, some small, nameless village in Quang Nai province. It was not really an ambush. I don't know why the platoon leaders were telling us this. What it was was it, it became one, but it wasn't meant to be one. What it was was three of our four platoons did a cordon around this village. We encircled it. And then the fourth platoon was out in the, a rice paddy. So the village is over here. Imagine it's being surrounded by, by three of our platoons. And the idea was at full dawn, they would press to the village and they would press the enemy, the Viet Cong, in our case, out of the village, out into a rice paddy, where the fourth platoon, my own, was to gun them down. Well, these things never worked. You could hear us coming from 10 trillion miles away, our you know, canteens clanking, guys smoking when they shouldn't doing it. This was in 1969 when the army discipline was at, probably it's at Nadir, it was really bad. It was filled with draftees such as, my, as myself, people who flunked Cub Scouts and, you know, didn't, weren't exactly great soldiers. Um, they didn't work. But on this night, I can remember as vividly as I can see you right now, the uh, dawn beginning to break, right, right over the horizon, just a little thread of kind of purpley black stuff, where the black was going to purple. And I could hear, to my right, our three platoons moving into the village. Um, I could hear dogs start barking, I could hear voices in the village. Uh, just, the, just the sound and that, that strange purple light scared me. About 30 seconds later, three silhouettes came out of the village, as far away as people in, I don't know, the third and fourth row here, very pretty close, 25 feet, something like that. They were like ducks at a carnival, where you, you know, that shooting gallery thing where you shoot at them. They just perfectly silhouetted. There were 30 of us, roughly, in my platoon, lined up along a paddy dike. And we had, it was just, and we opened up with whatever American industry and technology could provide us. Machine gun fire, M16 fire, claymores going off, hand grenades. We unloaded everything the arsenals at Hartford had given to us, and we really unloaded it, myself included. Um, we had seen that two of these three figures had weapons, so we knew they were the enemy. There was, they weren't civilians, they were the enemy. Although that word never even occurred to me, the word enemy. All that occurred to me was, dear Jesus, let me live. And that's all that occurred to me.
around well, eight minutes, ten minutes, nine minutes later, something on that order, full light had come up. You could actually see stuff. And we, our uh, company commander went out into the third row here, 20 feet away, and they found one dead Viet Cong. This is with 30 people opening up on everything you have, and one person is hit. It shows how bad we were as shots, I guess, in part. But it also shows how afraid you are in combat, that you tend, to, you, you tend not to see everything. You kind of, your vision narrows in, and you're talking to yourself, kind of chipmunk talk, not human kind of talk. It's adrenaline talk, endorphin talk, it's that kind of talk. It's the talk of going on inside your stomach. You're talking with your chest. Uh, when you do that, you tend to shoot high, and we, uh, we must have. Well, I will never know whether a bullet from my weapon killed that guy. It is beyond knowing. It was chaos. There was all this fire going out. And I will go to my grave never knowing whether it was my bullet that hit that. It was about a 16-year-old kid, younger than the kid in the story. I made him a little older. Uh, but he... I'm not going to ever know. In a story, though, unlike in nonfiction, where I just have to tell the facts, but in a story, I can take responsibility for that person's death. Can't do it in nonfiction, because you don't know, but in a story, you can know the guy throwing the hand grenade with my name. It's my way of facing the truth. I was a soldier, I pulled the trigger, and I can't excuse myself by saying, oh, I don't know, therefore not guilty. I was present. I was there on that ambush. And whether I know or not is irrelevant to my participation. I was part of the war, uh, and on the ground, an immediate part of the war, and I've got to take responsibility for it and not just uh, shuck it off as somebody else's responsibility. So yeah, the story's invented, but it's true to my nightmares, it's true to the story I just told you. And often, when I am sitting alone in a room, or I'm at the dinner with my kids, something will look up and that, that young dead guy out there in that rice paddy will come before me as I'm chewing on my sirloin steak or eating my mashed potatoes just at an ordinary dinner at night. And for a moment, I won't be with my family. It'll pass quickly. I won't show anything. I won't tear up. It'll just be there and then gone. Another reason for writing that story, then, has to do with the fact that wars don't end when you sign peace treaties. We think they do. The hostilities are over. But the war doesn't end. The mother of my best friend, who was blown into a tree in Quang Nai province, a kid named Chip Merricks, black kid from Orlando, Florida, wakes up every night at 2 o'clock in the morning. She's now in her late 90s, and she says, where's my baby? Where's my baby? Well, her baby has been dead for 48 years. You think the war is over for her? You think it'll ever be over? And then think about the children of, who never even knew their fathers, the people who die in war, as both Vietnamese children and American children, who never know. I wore a shirt tonight that uh, my wife gave me as a Christmas present. He got it at a J.C. Penney's, this white shirt, off I-35 down in Austin, Texas. You can just get on your I-35 and you can go right past my house. <laughs> Not quite on it, but within, I don't know, it's 400 yards of it. Wave as you go by. Well, the shirt, as, you, as you, you're, many of you have already guessed, has a little tag in the collar, and you know what the tag says, don't you? It says, made in Vietnam. Wars are sold to us as pending catastrophes. 
If we don't go kill people, terrible things will happen. Dominoes will fall, the communists will land in the streets of Seattle or San Francisco. You'll lose your liberties, they're under pressure of the communist menace. Well, the worst possible outcome occurred in Vietnam. We lost. We lost. I mean, there are some veterans who say, we didn't lose, meaning the soldiers, and they may be, well be right. But the country lost. The communists are in control, and, and the, they are. They held the ground, their real estate, and they still hold it. And they've established their system. The worst possible outcome. But who in this room wakes up every day thinking, oh my God, what a catastrophe. All my liberties are gone, and the communists are in Seattle for sure. There they are, the brigades of them. The dominoes fell in Southeast Asia. Of course, they didn't. It went the other way. It went fascist, not communist, by and large. Laos, yes. For us, no. High school kids, as we're in this room tonight, are bicycling up and down Highway 1 in Vietnam on their excursions that they go on. Business is booming. J.C. Penney is buying its shirts, and I'm wearing one of them tonight. There was a catastrophe, all right, but the catastrophe was three million dead Vietnamese minimum and almost 60,000 dead Americans. And for what? Who cares? Who thinks about it much? One of the great services that Ken and uh, Lynn did, the, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick with his film, was to reawaken America to its own history which I try to do in my stories as well, through writing about little discrete events, the kind I read to you tonight. And uh, the film that John and I were both part of, we, we, I'm, sure, I'm not speaking for John, but I, I just assumed from having barbecue with him last night, is to educate America about our own history. Um, and not just the events of our history, but the emotional impact that's still alive in America among so many people. Not just the millions of veterans, but their families. I'm going to conclude, if we're almost there, with one final anecdote. I had somebody I would set up to wave when my 40 minutes were up. I just got the wave. <laughs> so I had a, I had, this is eight, ten years ago, I had a letter that came to me through my publisher from a 26-year-old elementary school teacher in, uh, my, from my home state of Minnesota. And I'm going to paraphrase the letter for you as best I can. I, I, you, I used to carry this with me and just read it, but it blew away one night in Chicago, so I'm, now I just have to do it from memory. But uh, this is very accurate. The letter began, Dear Mr. O'Brien, I've been meaning to write you for many years, now I have to. I want to tell you the story of my youth. I grew up in a, a suburb of, of Minneapolis called Edina. And uh, I remember as a little girl in elementary school being afraid to go to the dinner table because my dad was so silent at that table that it, it stung. I'd ask him questions and he wouldn't answer me. He'd stare at his plate. And as dinner went on, his, the cords in his neck would begin to stiffen and stand out, and his face would go blotchy red. Uh, she said, by the time, I'm, this, I'm paraphrasing, I got a 30-page letter, I'm on page 8 now. By the time I got into middle school, she said, things had gotten so tense in our house that I felt more like a counselor than a daughter, trying to keep the peace between my mom and dad. She said that at some point um, near the end of middle school, she'd gone down into the basement and found under a cot a little box that was filled with little, little trinkets, the military medals, some faded photographs, Vietnam era, a part of a stripper's bra, like one half of it from some floor show over in Vietnam, uh, dented uh, cartridge casings, and other you know, stuff that awakened her that my dad was in a war, which she didn't know. She's, what, 12, 13 years old, whatever you are, and, you know, they're the end of middle school. She said one day in early high school, her mom was vacuuming the rug and turned the vacuum off and said to the girl, 
you know, I've never really loved your father. And uh, the girl said, why did you marry him? And her mother said, I married him out of pity. I'd had a few dates with him in college. He went off to the war, came back, the silent, angry, bitter guy that you see at the dinner table every night. And then, near the end of her high school years, uh, in an AP English class, she was assigned the things they carried. She brought it home, she left it on a coffee table in her house, and her dad saw it and picked it up and read a couple of pages, just that list of stuff that soldiers carry. And that night at the dinner table, He talked, um, not a lot, but a little, and he talked about the list, just, just the physical stuff that soldiers in Vietnam had carried all those years ago. The next night, he talked a little more and read a little more. And then the mother chimed in and said what it was like to be living with this silent guy all these years. How do you love somebody who won't talk to you? She concluded her letter to me, the girl, who's now not a girl, she's a 26-year-old woman, by saying, you know, my mom and dad are not perfect. They still have their problems, but they're together. And I don't think they would have been if that book hadn't been lying in that coffee table. There are occasions when books in this world can do things beyond the English classroom and beyond bestseller lists. and They can actually do things in human lives. We're in a great, great library here that I got a short tour of today, and I'm here to celebrate, not my book, but books and this library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, if you uh, want to ask a question, if you come up to the microphone, and obviously this is a very emotional subject, so uh, questions, please, or short statements. I'm one of those AP teachers, and you have touched over a thousand of my students' lives. It's one of their very favorite novels, so thank you for that. And I've always wondered myself, that secret smile of the man who passed through, don't call me the, the lady who is asking what's true and what's not true, but between you and the man who walks through, the, the secret thought, I just want to know a little bit more. Tell me more about what you want to know. Uh, <laughs> what's going on between the two I'll of you? I'll make it up. I mean, I... <laughs> What's the secret smile or the secret thought between you two? Um, it's a great question, but I really don't have an answer for it because the, 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 the thing I'm struggling with with your question is it is invented. So it was, but it was invented 27 years ago <laughs> when the book was written. And I don't want to pretend to recall that which I can't. Right. That I recall the book. But I don't recall all the drafts that went into it. It took me, I don't know, six years to write a very short book. And there were six, there were six really painful years as well. And, and pain you try to push away. You don't, you're, you're unsuccessful, but you try. 
And so I, I don't have an answer. I don't, I'm not the person I was when I wrote it back then. If you'd asked me to comment on why things are in the book, that I could do. But what's not in it, I just don't know the answer. I wish I did. The great question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hello, Tim. We have something in uh, common. I got drafted in uh, 68 and uh, ended up in country in April 69 and um, medevaced out. And um, I was going through your book and the part about the baby buffalo, mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a really hard um, chapter to get through. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, maybe elaborate a little bit on what, first of all, yeah. it was, was probably fiction, right? <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, well, there are a couple things I have to say, that my job is not to sanitize war and sprinkle Ajax on it and clean it all up and give you a nice, pretty version of it, the kind you get on Memorial Day or the 4th of July. Uh, my job is to try to, as accurately and as honestly as I can, represent what I witnessed. And uh, it's not a popular thing to do. Uh, our country, like all countries, uh, loves words like service and sacrifice and doing your duty for your country. We love stuff like that. And I, gr I agree with it all. It's just that the details of the sacrifice, you don't want to hear. And the country doesn't want you to hear it. That, that we drape, you know, we used to be able, at least in Vietnam, see the coffins, you know, and we can't do that anymore. They're hidden from us. We used to be able to watch the evening news and see the firefights happening before our eyes. Doesn't happen anymore. Or if it does, it's just a very brief little clip. You usually, usually will see the aftermath of it. Um, so, as a novelist and a storyteller, my job, I think, is to try to, try to vi viscerally depict the feeling of combat. There are joyful things that happen in combat, too. One of them, which is the relief of being alive. Even with all the death around you, there's a sense you're, you feel good, guilty about it. Like, why me? But there's a relief that comes over you. Thank God it was Chip and not me blown into that tree. You can't help but feel it as you look at the wreckage of his body. He was mush. There was nothing left of this guy. He was black at one time, but you couldn't tell his color as he was up in that tree. He was just mush. And to describe the consequences of it, uh, of, a, of a war, in a kind of individual, up-close sort of way, uh, I think is necessary. Uh, it's, uh, the alternative is to put our heads in the sand to pretend war is clean. And, uh, uh, and it, 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 it isn't. So the water buffalo is an example of that. I, I didn't shoot, a, I didn't have a scene describing the shooting of a person, did I? I chose an animal to sort of make it a little more palatable, but even that seems to gross people out. If you eat hamburger, what problem do you have with that scene? If you go to McDonald's or Burger King at the airport, as I did when I flew in here, what problem do you have with it, unless you want to close your eyes again and pretend the animal's not really dead? I don't know how you do that, but there, there aren't butcher. I mean, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. We want to hide, it, hide things from us that are that we're causing is a, you know, when you, when you declare wars or you go to war, you're, you're contributing to it happening. And yet we want to hide our heads from the... So I wanted, to, I, wanted to, I wanted it to hurt. I wanted the buffalo to make you feel the gobs of flesh coming off that animal. And I wanted you to feel Rat Kiley's hurt as he was doing it. He wasn't doing it out of spite or to be cruel. His best friend had been killed, blown into a tree, my friend Chip. And there is, there's poor crying rat shooting a, shooting a baby water buffalo. Um, taking out his hurt, uh, losing his best friend in the world. Uh, that sort of thing, uh, at least in Quang Nai province where I was, was not all that uncommon. You know, taking things out on buffaloes and burning villages and houses. Uh, it, it was, that was what the war was. It was that way. 
And the least of the ugly things I saw uh, was the shooting of a buffalo. It is based on a real thing. I, I revved it up big time. I went into more, much more detail. It wasn't just one person shooting at a buffalo in the real world. It was all of us, myself included, a whole company. We'd lost a man that morning. We were crossing a rice paddy. There was a buffalo, a water buffalo. It wasn't a baby. I made that up too. It was a buffalo. We all opened up on it out of anger and sorrow and grief. We could never find the enemy. They found us. They had no uniforms. There was no front. So we opened up on a buffalo to take out the frustration and the bitterness and the grief we felt and the terror we felt. It'll happen to us. Um, and we're 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. It's not like we're mature adults anymore. We're basically kids. I mean, not just fresh out of kiddom, moving into adulthood. And you're full of that sort of stuff that goes on in you. You get angrier than you would if you were a sort of a mature adult. Uh, so the buffalo, st the buffalo scene comes out of that. I wanted to make it feel ugly, uh, because war is ugly. Uh, but I also wanted to show something about what propelled Rat Kiley to do that shooting of the, of the baby buffalo, which was an evil, malevolent intent. It was done out of hurt. He, in fact, he's, there's a line in there. He didn't want to kill the buffalo. He wanted to hurt it. He wanted to hurt it back for all the hurt he was feeling. And uh, he did. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello, I'm a teacher also, and at our school we have our seniors read your novel, and uh, it almost always resonates with them, so again, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so when you were not much older than they are now, you had a decision to make, uh, as did many in our country, about avoiding the draft or not, and I think maybe you said in an interview before that um, you or others made a decision by kind of not deciding, and maybe I, I said by not deciding mm -hmm. and maybe acquiescing to family or your town or wherever. Right. <clears throat> so I wonder now um, what you might say to our 18, 19, 20 year olds today who face um, difficult life choices, whether it's involving the military or going to college or other um, choices that don't correspond to the desires of their families. Mm -hmm. What a great question, and again, I'm not a philosopher enough to be able to answer it well. Like, I have children, as I mentioned earlier, not far from 18. In fact, one 14, that's four years away. Uh, they know I was a soldier, and they know I was, in, they knew I'm, I was in Vietnam, and they're kind of asking the question you asked, only in a personal way. What, what happens to me uh, if our country goes to war? What should I do? And, I, and the, the difficulty with being a father as everybody who's a father knows, is that if you give advice, they're going to do the opposite of what you say. <laughs> you say, don't kill people, they're going to go across the neighbor and blow them away. So, you, you, I have to be careful. You, you have to preach at people, you can't, you can't convert people's um, temperaments, their dispositions, that you are who the person you are. Rationality only works so, so far, and then something other t something else takes over. Um, that I do with my children and my in speaking events such as this. I don't uh, disguise my my disgust for the war in Vietnam. I think it was more than a mistake. Mistakes are unintentional. That's what a mistake is. This wasn't a mistake. It was a lot worse than that. It was intentional. And anybody who watched the Burns series heard the, our, two of our major presidents on tape saying that they were lying to us. Let's hold on to the night. I know there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but let's just hold on to the next election. So I'm not talking directly about you go to war or not. I'm trying to make my children and audiences attuned to things like duplicity. Does it matter? Does it not matter that our, that our leaders are duplicitous? Does, it, does, it not, does hypocrisy not matter in the world? People who 
tout wars sitting in their safe TV studios in their bow ties saying, let's go kill people. And I think, why the hell aren't you there? You're old enough to go to a war. Or why aren't you sending your children over if you're so for the war? Why don't you ship your daughter over to Baghdad tomorrow? Or do you only support a war insofar as other people die? Not your kids and not you, God forbid. You're in your TV studio. There should be a law. You can support wars, it's a free country, but then go. Go! <laughs> Otherwise, what, what, what in, you've, now you're seeing the real Tim O'Brien. <laughs> that, that, that the, the, the hypocrisy, I don't know if it's Vietnam or it's just life. I don't know what the hell it comes from, but hypocrisy gets to me. And it seems so irrational and also so destructive of the world, urging other people to go die and I'm staying here. What, what is with that? I mean, Cochise fought and, you know, Crazy Horse went into battle. And during the Civil War, some of our politicians resi you know, resigned and went into battle and became, you know, died in battles. But there's something about this, this insular, I'll isolate myself, unless other people from Jackson, Mississippi, you know, or Harlem, or East L.A., or Worthington, Minnesota, or a small town in Missouri. Let them do the dying, and not me, the guy who's, you know, pushing for, for a bellicosity and belligerence in the world. So, there, you kind of heard my answer there. You shouldn't have asked that question. It's only... <laughs> It's the only question that can really get me feeling how I feel right now. I don't know how, that's, I'm a smoker, and right now all I want to do is go out there and have a cigarette. And <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one last question and then wrap it up. Is that about, seem right? Well, maybe we could take these people Two. in okay. line, and okay. there are a couple of people over oh, here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, oh, if that's okay. Oh. Uh, I think I'm next now. <laughs> I am a writer that doesn't write anymore, and I've noticed the Hendrix cap, which my husband has pointed out. It's a mm -hmm. sore point in our family. And I want to know, if you could have, if you should have, when you graduated from undergrad and you were going to go to grad school, if you didn't go to the war. Did what? If you didn't go to the war, would you be a writer? Good question, and again, I don't know the answer. That's oh, come on, could have, should have. You said we could do that. You yeah. can make it up now. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can tell you what I suspect, that I'd wanted to be a writer from the time I was a little boy, maybe seven years old, really young. My dad uh, was on the library board in my hometown. He brought books into the house. My mom was an avid reader. And I remember as vividly as anything from Vietnam, an image of my dad reading a, a book by lamplight on a winter kind of late afternoon, dark was falling, and, and uh, I was six, seven years old, and I remember the look of peace and contentment on my dad's face, that he was a bad alcoholic, things were bad in our house, but and when he was in that book, I remember thinking how much I wanted to be the book. So he would look at me, the way he was looking at that book. And so I think I probably would have tried to be a writer. Yes, hi. Um, I'm a teacher at North Kansas City High School. Um, I'm here with other teachers. Oh, sorry. I'm here with other teachers and students from our school. So, <laughs> first, I just wanted to thank you for writing something that really makes us all feel. Um, but my second question, my real question for you is, I'm sure you can tell, um, where did Elroy Berdahl come from? A little louder. Where did Elroy Berdahl come from, that character? Oh, okay. I don't know if I'll just tell people who Elroy Berdahl was. Just, I mean, he's, uh, there's a story in the book called On the Rainy River, a character of my name decides I'm going to Canada, goes up to the Canadian border, is taken in by a man named Elroy Berdahl to sort of think it all over. Should I cross the Rainy River into Canada or should I go to Nam? And the story is set with a, this man named Elroy Birdall, who is uh, in some ways a mixture of uh, God and my dad and John Updike and kind of the authority figures in my life, a wise but 
But a guy who, like most Minnesota Lutherans, doesn't acknowledge the obvious, that he knows this, he's smart, he knows this kid staying with him is young, he knows there's a war on, he knows Canada is there, and he can put, you know, two plus one and he gets three. This kid's going to Canada because of the war, but doesn't mention it. He comes from some, some the characters don't come often from a real single person, for me anyway. They come from an amalgam of a bunch of different people. That, that and it, as soon as a few sentences are written, they become themselves. They aren't, they aren't based on anything really, except they are as real as you're real to me. In fact, they're more real than you are because I don't know you. I, I haven't spent six years with you as I did with Elroy. <coughs> I, I, can, I can kind of smell him more than see him. I, I can, he's got that kind of mid, that, that upper Midwest, Northwoods, tree, pining, sort of haven't washed in a while smell. <laughs> <laughs> that people up there, you know, kind of have. They're 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 t they're toughing it out in northern Minnesota. So, uh, he, but he comes. He does. He, he might be a, a spokesman for my conscience in part, and how divided I, I've always been about the war. That I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. I'm not going to say I'm not. I'm proud to have endured the war, uh, as much as I. Uh, also hated the war and continue to hate it. We shouldn't have wars unless they're, they're winnable and unless they're just. But, so the, you can see the, the con, con, contest going inside me even up here. And Elroy was there to help this kid, not tell him what to do, but to be there. The way, the, the way God doesn't announce do stuff to me and say, you do this or don't do that or go into war is right or wrong. There's a kind of, there's a kind of presence of, of, of uh, conscience over my shoulder as I was writing Elroy's character. But it wasn't going to tell me what to do. It's going to say, just do your best to be a moral man in really uh, impossible circumstances. Thank you. Yes. Does this, this work? Oh, nice. Um, I am uh, a junior. I'm a junior from uh, Shawnee Mission West, and uh, we were assigned this book for English, and I had to read it over the summer, and it was good. If it wasn't good, I wouldn't be here, but um, uh, it was really, really good, really good. Um, and I had two questions from reading the book that are kind of the same, they're kind of the same question, so I wanted to ask him while I was here. Uh, the first one is, Norman's character, he commits suicide, right? Because he's unable to talk about what he's been through, and he's from Iowa. So when a soldier dies, it's KIA for killed in action, and when he, when he kills himself, it's in Iowa, so if you shorten it, it makes Kiowa, it spells out the name Kiowa, K-I-O-W-A. Was that on purpose, or was that a coincidence? Was what on purpose? Was that, was that on purpose? Was, was what on purpose? Kiowa, Kiowa's name, K-I-O-A. Oh, Kiowa. Kill, yeah, Kiowa, sorry. Kiowa is an island off Georgia, the Kiowa. Sorry, Kiowa, I, I don't know, know how to spell Kiowa. it. Kiowa. Yeah, I don't know what you meant. I attached yeah. myself to Kiowa, right. I don't know. Yeah. Was that on purpose or not? And the second question is, do you have, um, do you care how people interpret your stories? Do you want it interpreted one way? Can it be any way? Yeah, that's a, I'll do the latter one first, because uh, I remember it best. The, uh, the, the writer and the reader are basically just strangers who brush past each other. You're, I remember being in an auditorium exactly like this one, maybe, I don't know, six months ago, and I read a, another chapter from the things they carried. And it was emotional, hard going, my voice cracked, and it was hard, like it was tonight. And then it was all over, and I was signing books, and near the end of an evening, I was tired. And a kid came up to me, not maybe roughly your age, maybe a little older, but not a lot. 
And he said, uh, that, I know that was hard going. I really appreciate your effort to, do, you know, to be honest with us. And I said, you're welcome. And then he turned away and started to leave. And he said, you know, that I got to tell you that I've been thinking about joining the Marine Corps now for the last seven or eight months. And now having listened to you, I know I will be joining. And I went back to my comfort inn and <laughs> swore at the mirror and, <laughs> and <laughs> smoked a bunch of cigarettes and thinking, you poor, dumb, useless yo-yo about myself. <laughs> but then I surrender, as you just have to, that this, this stranger thing that people interpret books the way they are going to do it. Uh, I'm not sure how that interpretation happens. I'm going to join the Marines after listening to me read about what I wrote. But it happens. And there's nothing you can do about it. And it's, I guess, for the better in the end, that we all have different takes on everything that happens to us, including books. So it's, uh, I surrender to it. Uh, the Kiowa question, Kiowa is, uh, my best friend is a Kiowa Indian. Um, and I wanted to do honor to him. He's much like the Kiowa who dies in the, in the book. But I met him well, well uh, before even contemplating writing the things they carried. I mean, a long time before. He was in Vietnam, but I didn't know him in Vietnam. He just became a friend of mine at a, an event like this. We just hung out together and became good friends. We have now been friends for 30 years. So I just, well, I just chose that to do honor to him. But also, uh, because he carries some of the characteristics of, Ki of the Kiowa in the book, he's, he's a decent, uh, moral guy in the midst of great immorality in the war. And I thought he would be an appropriate character to put in the book, and I did. That isn't to say that the real friend of mine is in that book. It's, everything's invented about the character, except for one thing, that's his quality of decency. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, last two. OK, uh, I was Lieutenant Funk in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I was in Quang Nai province, 1969, oh, wow. 1970. I went over as an MI officer. I was uh, part of the Phuong Long program, the Phoenix program, mm -hmm. which was the uh, neutralization of the Viet Cong infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got to my duty station, which was Minh Long, I, the infrastructure was gone, so I became a district senior advisor. And I must say that my job was very fulfilling, and I enjoyed it. We didn't take lives, we saved lives. Uh, I know that you were in Quang Nai. Uh, of course, that was the home of the infamous My Lai village. Yes. And I was there when Lieutenant Calley was being questioned, and I will say railroaded by the press. I sat next to a lot of people. He was so what? Railroaded by the press that I feel. But he like admitted he doing it. How was he railroaded? Um, his uh, my interpreter was in the next village, and I when he was uh, being questioned, I told my interpreter, I said, I'm very sorry for what happened, uh, the American pe uh, soldiers. My interpreter said, Don't you ever say that to me again? He said, I'm from the <coughs> village next door, and they killed all of my people, my people. And uh, he said they got what they deserved. Now, I say railroaded, you may say a different thing. But anyhow, about a month later, I saw a person. I was at Duck Fo, and they brought in a soldier from uh, Lieutenant Callie's platoon. He had run into a grenade face high. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the worst fatality I'd ever seen. Eyeballs were backed by his ear, mm -hmm. all his face was blown away, mm -hmm. and they're still trying to save him. Mm -hmm. Where I was was 80% Montagnard, 20% Vietnamese. I had to deal with ethnic, ethnics because the Vietnamese kind of looked down on the Montagnards. This bracelet I wear is a friendship bracelet given to me by the Montagnards. Uh, 
-hmm. And I must say, while I was there, we never lost a villager. I taught them how to defend themselves. I taught them how to work with each other. When I left, the village and the district was the model district for Vietnam. It was the least populated and the poorest district in all of Vietnam. And I must say, that's poor. And when I left, we left it in good shape. And I must say, when you were talking about conscription. About what? About conscription, conscription. soldiers being conscripted. That was the worst problem I had was with the regular American army. And I was trying to work with the Vietnamese in Mountain Yards and the soldiers were so much against mm -hmm. the Vietnamese because they were there, they were conscripted. And I understood that mm -hmm. because I joined at 3 p.m. one day. I got home at 5 and I had the letter from LBJ. <laughs> so I was able to go to OCS. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, I understand that uh, a conscripted army is not the best fighting army yeah. in the world. Yeah. I enjoyed your book. Good. And uh, I could probably write my own book, too. <laughs> We had many, many. No, I, just, I'm not, but I appreciate what you said. I, I, where, where, so where were you in Quang Nai? I the, was in Minh Long Province. Okay. Where were you? Well, Quang Nai is a province. I was on a place called LZ Gator, but I was all over the province because oh, oh, okay. we just worked as an LZ, infantry LZ, unit. So I wasn't in any one place really. Okay. But we had a fire base that was. Were you with the Americal Division? I'm afraid to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a division formed in war. Yeah. And it was a good division. Uh, I had a lot of good experiences with them. Yeah. So. We had our problems. <laughs> yeah. I think the volunteer army is the best army because it's volunteer. Mm -hmm. And the subscription was not the case. Well, I there. appreciate your comments. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Last question. Yes. Mr. O'Brien, would you like to hear a story from the um, fighting for hearts and minds in Toronto? 1973. Would I want to hear a story? A short, oh. a short story, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to hear a novel. But yeah, I mean, go, if, if it's short, yeah. I uh, dodged the draft, crossed over uh, from, Windsor and, uh, from uh, Detroit into Windsor on uh, June 15th, 1970. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want to flash forward to uh, 1973. The United States forces were pulled out of uh, Vietnam but it was before um, uh, April the 30th, 1975, when the um, country was reunited or the communist takeover or whatever, you, whatever, however you want to look at that. But So Canada was participating in the International Commission of uh, Control and Supervision. That was uh, Canada, Hungary, Indonesia, and Poland, or CHIP. Canada uh, participated from um, um, January until um, July. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason they dropped out. Okay, at the time in the 1970s there was three papers in Toronto. There was the Toronto Sun, the Toronto Star, and the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail was uh, the best paper. It had the best editors. It had the best uh, proofreaders. They covered the arts the best. The Toronto Sun was, had the biggest circulation. People in the uh, United States know it for Tor Star and Harlequin Romances. The uh, Toronto Sun was an upstart paper that just um, started in 1971. Um, so an officer in uh, the, this International Control and um, Commission wanted to give the Toronto Star an exclusive story that the Poles were shipping from Poland crates of umbrellas and wine glasses. And he, gave them, he wanted to give them an exclusive. They're shipping crates of wine glasses and umbrellas. It's the Cold War. Everybody's suspicious of everyone else. So the article included photographs of the crates. And you could clearly see wine glass and an umbrella. It's the symbol for keep dry and fragile. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to Tim O'Brien.